today we are going to talk about a very important reaction, the Diels-Alder reaction. It's so important that this entire lecture is going to be covering only that one reaction. As usual with reactions, we always pour through the stereoselectivity and regioselectivity, but before we go through that, we're going to have to understand the driving force for that. So we're going to be doing some orbital uh, diagrams. So we're going to dive deep into this reaction that actually looks deceptively simple. Um, and so why is it so important? Why do we spend an entire lecture on it? Well, it's named after Diels Alder. That's not one person, that's two. Uh, Otto Diels and Kurt Alder, uh, for which they both won the Nobel Prize. And they shared that prize in 1928 for discovering this reaction. And this reaction is a carbon-carbon bond forming reaction. Ta-da, that's why it's so important. Uh, so it forms another important um, feature of this carbon-carbon bond forming reaction is that it forms a six-membered ring, which is a very common ring size in bioactive molecules. So to be able to access that uh, geometry and shape and ring size so quickly is a powerful technique. It's still widely used today. Uh, so that's why it's in your textbook and it's such an important reaction and we get to spend um, the next several um, minutes, <laughs> I'd say more like an hour and a half, on it. And uh, I hope you enjoy it because it is a very interesting reaction. It's one of my favorites because of how elegant it is, yet there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. So let's just dive right in and see what the template is for a Diels-Alder reaction. Notice the pieces here. We have a diene. So I'm going to label this. So we have a diene. We have a dienophile. That's the alkene. It loves the diene. And presumably that's why they react to form our cycloadduct, our cyclic ring. So notice we went from acyclic structures to a cyclic structure, six-membered ring. And then it also formed a carbon-carbon bond. Where did we form this carbon-carbon bond? Well, if we track the mechanism, it's a very simple mechanism, concerted three arrows, does not matter whether we push it clockwise or counterclockwise. So uh, we would take an electron uh, or a pair of electrons from the pi bond and the dienophile attack this carbon. So we essentially get this new bond right here. And that releases the electrons in the pi bond here to between these two carbons, which forms the new pi bond here. And upon forming that pi bond, these pi bond electrons are released to attack this carbon, which forms the new sigma bond here. So we form one new pi bond and two new sigma bonds. So that's actually, so two sigma CC bonds and one pi CC bond. So I'm gonna highlight those. This is a feature of all the Diels-Alder reactions. We close a ring uh, from acyclic pieces. We can even close a new ring from cyclic pieces and make an extra ring. Let's number them and track it. So the diene, let's number this one, two, three, four. Uh, excuse me, I did an extra number there and do that. Three, four carbons. So those are the four pieces that react from the diene. Notice all the R groups attached. We could have lots more carbons in that diene. Are they gonna react? No, the business end is those four carbons. You could have more substituents. That does not mean they will participate in the reaction. So one, two, three, four. So those four carbons came from our diene. What came from our dienophile? Let's number this five and six. Here's five and six. So li likewise, the dienophile can have substituents on it, but only two of the carbons uh, will react to form that cyclic product. Okay, so this is called the Diels-Alder reaction, which is the name reaction, but the more technical term is a 4n plus 2. 4n comes from the fact that we have four pi electrons from the diene, 2, 4, plus 2, added to two pi electrons from the dienophile. So 4n plus 2, cycloaddition. Notice we lost pi bonds, so it's an addition reaction and we did it in a cyclic fashion, hence the cycloaddition term. So this is a type of pericyclic reaction. Pericyclic reactions have sort of a cyclic transition state, 
um, what we would describe as possibly even an aromatic um, transition state in this case, which we'll get to in a minute, and it's concerted. Okay, so in order to fully understand what's going on here, before we get into the regio and stereochemistry, we're going to dive deeper and go into the orbitals. Why are we even bothering to do that? Well, if you step back and look, we usually can identify really quickly in the reactions we've studied up to this point, uh, what is the driving force for a reaction to happen? Who's attracted to who? Who's the nucleophile? Who's the electrophile? Looking here, there's not a really obvious reason that this diene wants to react with a dienophile. Um, sure, there's more elect pi electrons here, so we could say it's electron rich. And so this would therefore be more electron poor, but um, that seems a little less obvious than when we have a full on negative or positive charge like we're used to working with um, in some of the other reactions. So we're gonna look at the orbital diagram to see how it's beneficial for these to um, interact and drive this reaction forward. So we're gonna look at the frontier molecular orbitals. So remember that means we look at the homo and lumo, and we're looking at the conjugated pi system. So the diene's conjugated, so we're looking at the pi system. And remember, we had four pi electrons in the diene. So the diene was beta diene. Remember that had four pi electrons that we have to worry about, account for in our orbital diagram. And the dienophile, I'm, so in other words, I'm gonna keep this super simple and make all those R groups H's. Uh, the dienophile, I'll make simple ethylene. Because why complicate it? The business end of all of the reaction is happening between those six carbons. And so those, uh, those would have two pi electrons. So we have two sets of molecular orbital diagrams to draw. I'm gonna draw first the diene, then I'll draw the dienophile. So this goes back to what we learned about conjugated uh, pi systems. We can draw the frontier orbitals, and because we have four pi electrons, we have four sets of orbitals to draw. So this is that sketch and color sort of activity. And we're just gonna draw, and then we, you know, we find the nodes, we draw all the possibilities, and we have four energy levels. And remember the lowest energy level would have no nodes. So we have psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four. And remember we fill from the bottom up and we pair when we are before we elevate to the next level. So when we get here, we expect to have reached our LUMO, not occupied, our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. When we get here, this should be our HOMO, highest occupied molecular orbital. Let's shade them in so we remember just a good review what that looks like. Bottom level, lowest energy level has no nodes. So that means all in the same phase. When they're not changing phases, we have no, um, no nodes there. When we change phase, every time we do that, we have a node. So if we change the next energy level up, if we had zero nodes to begin with, we would have one node at the next level. So we could imagine doing that right at down the middle. And we could suddenly change phase, and there would be our node. Right? And then we can imagine one, I do that in green just to let that stand out right here. We can imagine doing that, having two nodes at the next energy level, and then three, because remember it's n minus one nodes. So we're at energy level one, n minus one means zero nodes. Energy level two, two minus one means one node. Energy level three, three minus one means two nodes. Energy level four, four minus one means one, two, three nodes. So we shade that in as uh, as we go, whoops, I'm gonna do that in black like I did before. Shade that in as we go. Uh, so I don't change phase until I reach a node, just like that. And now we go up, down, up, down. Change phase every chance we get. Okay, so those were my anti-bonding orbitals up at the top, uh, bonding orbitals down at the bottom. Not too concerned with that at the moment. I'm mostly looking at my frontier molecular orbitals. Those are the ones that react, homo and lumo. Now I'm going to compare that to what's going on with my um, alkene. Only has two pi electrons, therefore only two options to draw. 
So here's my p orbitals. I don't have four, I only have two. And they're stuck there, that one energy level. And remember two minus one means we have one node. One minus one means we have zero nodes. So this one is the one with zero nodes. I'm gonna shade that in to reflect that. Zero nodes and one node. So when I filled this up, much simpler, right? Pretty quick. I have my homo here of my ethylene, my dienophile, and my lumo. Now let's just write that out. This was my diene, and this was my dienophile. Okay, so what happens in this reaction is you have to have the frontier molecular orbitals overlap. And I'm gonna let you know that this is, happens by taking the diene frontier molecular orbital and one, no, the frontier molecular orbital of the dienophile. Well, what are the frontier molecular orbitals? The homo and the lumo. Which one's which? Who uses the homo and who uses the lumo? You only get to pick one of each because one's empty and one's full. So our options are lumo, of the diene with homo here, or homo of the diene with the lumo here. It turns out that this is the favorable interaction because the diene's more electron rich. So we take the filled orbitals from the diene. The dienophile is more electron poor, so we take the, em the first empty orbital from the dienophile. So we take the homo of the diene and the lumo of the dienophile. So I'm going to write that down here. Oops, let's see. Homo of the dyne, electron rich dyne, and the lumo of the electron poor dienophile. Okay, so that kind of makes sense, right? Because we the whole premise of getting a reaction to happen is to have something electron rich react with something electron poor. That's the electrostatic attraction. So at the orbital level, the frontier orbital level, we're going to have some filled orbitals overlap with empty orbitals before that bond occurs, right? So let's take a closer look. We're going to zoom out a little bit and look at how those can align. So in order for those orbitals to actually overlap, we have to have them align just so. So you, this is a, this is a um, chapter where you're really gonna want your molecular model kit. Um, both may be virtual, an uh, online you know, modeling program like, or, or a computer modeling program like Spartan, as well as one that's hands-on. They both have different strengths. So you might wanna just build a dyeing and um, a dienophile. And so a dienophile, I, I chose to put one substituent on there. So notice I have three carbons in my dienophile, but um, it really needs two. Those are the core carbons that react, but I could have substituents. I could have eight carbons. I could have things coming off of it, right? And my diene, I kept a simple butadiene. So uh, double, single, double bond. So it's uh, substituted. But what you have to uh, look at the geometry of how they can possibly over, overlap those orbitals. Remember that when you have a pi system, the p orbitals are coming above and below the plane while this is kept planar. So in order to keep this dying conjugated, this has to stay planar, and the p orbitals are going above and below the plane perpendicular to this plane. And if we're going to overlap p orbitals that are filled with some more empty molecular orbitals, then we need to have plane to plane overlap. So in other words, they're not just bumping into each other like some of the other reactions we've done. They have to strategically line up with stacked planes above or below. So in other words, the dienophile can go below the diene or the dienophile can stack above the diene. Okay, so notice that in the example I'm showing here, I'm trying to illustrate sort of a plane here and that's, we're gonna go back and forth with three-dimensional depictions because 
it's a challenge to only discuss this in 2D. So I've kind of created a plane here just for this particular uh, discussion. Um, and But I'll abandon that. We're going to keep going to models and other things as well. But this could be this could kind of slide underneath and this can slide above. Or this could have just as equally come from the top. Okay, so we can go have it approach from the bottom or approach from the top. I'm going to sketch in those orbitals, just the frontier ones. So based on what we drew earlier, in other words, uh, right here, I'm going to draw the homo. In, in other words, half up, half down for the dying. The lumo, half up, half down, for the dienophile. I'm going to draw that on the molecule now because we know those are the ones that are responsible for overlapping. So let's put that back. Okay, so let's sketch that in there. Notice this methyl, that's okay to be there. It's not part of the reaction, it's just a substituent. What's happening is one, two, three, four carbons are part of the core reactive carbons with this five and six carbon to make the cycloadduct. So I'm gonna sketch in the orbitals above and below the plane so we can understand why it needs to be situated like that. And I'm gonna fill them half on the bottom, half on the top. Remember we had the one with the one node was the, which one was that? The homo or the limo, right? Let's look. Homo of the dying. Oops, I used a highlighter there. Let's get back to a pen. Homo dying. Now we're going to look at the LUMO of the dienophile. So remember the LUMO looked like had one node, right? Lowest unoccupied because the occupied one was the um, HOMO. And so we have to decide how are we going to put that shaded up or down first? Well, I'm going to shade down first then up. Why did I do that? There's a rule. First, let me label this before I go on any further. LUMO dienophile. I'm going to draw some green dashed lines to indicate how these orbitals are overlapping. So the, they have to be in phase and overlap while they're in the same phase and that's called a symmetry allowed uh, transition. So it's called and it's, it's also referred to as conservation of orbital symmetry. So this lobe is going to overlap with the lobe that's in phase which is why I position those that way as opposed to flipping it around. This lobe's going to overlap with that one. So I'll write that in green. In phase overlap of frontier MOs follows conservation of orbital symmetry. So in some more advanced text, you might say, say this is a symmetry allowed um, operation. Okay, so that's physically how those orbitals are able to get in alignment to allow those bonds to form. Okay, so let's say we have a diene and a dienophile. And we wanna know, can we necessarily do a Diels alder there's going to be four requirements that are required for a Diels Alder to occur. So we're going to go through those one at a time uh, before we just assume um, we can always do the Diels Alder just because we have a diene and an alkene. Requirement number one, the diene must be conjugated. So in other words, something like that beautiful, it will do a Diels Alder. Something like this, no, that will not do a Diels Alder. That's a diene, but it's not a diene that's conjugated. So this one satisfies the requirement, this one does not. So notice the numbering pattern you might hear it referred to as a one, two, a one, three diene. So it has to be a one, three diene to do a Diels Alder, it has to be conjugated. So we will not be doing those with anything else. Diels Alder requirement, that's simple enough, right? Number two, the diene has to be in a certain conformation. 
let's get introduce a new term. S cis, which refers to sigma, S for sigma trans versus S for sigma cis. So around the sigma bond, we have to have it in the S cis conformation. So in other words, here's my molecular model of the diene. Notice the alkenes are on the same side of the sigma bond connecting them. It's free to rotate because this is a sigma bond between them, so carbons two and three, this way. In fact, this is usually the, one of the um, considered more stable conformations just simply because of sterics, right? However, it will not react unless it's S cis. So you have to be able to rotate. That's not a problem in this molecule at all. This can do a deals alder. Uh, it can rotate. But if there's a reason it can't rotate, uh, then that would be a problem for it doing a deals alder. So you've got to allow that rotation to occur. So for example, you're going to see, um, you're going to do, be doing deals alder reactions, and you're not going to always be given the, actually mostly won't be given, the molecules uh, written out in a way that's ready to go. They might require some rotation, right? Of course. So here's an example where we might have to do that, that rotation. So here's one where you're asked to predict the product of the reaction. And I like this one because it also has a little bit more uh, functionality to it. So there's some substituents coming off. So notice we have um, two alkenes and they're in a one, two, three, four, one, two, three pattern. That's my one, three diene. How do I know this is not my one, three diene? One, two, three. I have two pi bonds. This is not an alkene. So this is my diene. One, three, diene. Then what is this guy? And why does it look more complicated than ethylene? That's because it's not always going to be ethylene. You can have a dienophile with other groups on it. So the key part is your dienophile is an alkene, but it may have other things attached. So ethylene only had H's, but this one has an aldehyde. We could call it CHO if you want. doesn't matter. Um, you'll see it abbreviated frequently that way, in fact, because it has a C, an H, and an O, and we don't always have to draw it out. But the reactive part are these two carbons. So this is our dienophile. So this can do a deals alder, but we need to uh, show how it can line up first. So we're going to rotate around that bond because right now it is S trans. What do I mean by that? I mean the alkenes are on opposite sides. So notice this framework there. That's S trans. We got to rotate that. Oops, I'm going to write that out in a pen. So when we rotate, we do a little loop in the arrow, and we're going to make it S cis. And I will even actually also rotate it on its side so that it looks ready to form that ring. There we go. I'm going to number my carbons so we don't lose track. Let's call this one, two, three, four. I did not number my methyls. My methyls are not part of the carbons that make the ring. They're substituents so that I could do this, one, two, three, four. You can number your methyls if you want, as long as you're numbering those four car important carbons. Now I'm gonna line up my dienophile. I'll just call this CHO, okay? And it's ready to react. Push our arrows, so I'm gonna call this five and six. So since I used red already, I'll use green. Looks like it's going off into space, right? That's okay. You could either attack uh, this space right here with the arrow because that's where the new bond's forming or you can uh, show attacking that carbon. And I'll probably go back and forth between both of those conventions. Um, move those that pi bond between carbon two and three and then come back and form a bond between one and six. Okay, so that's gonna give me a cycloadduct with an alkene between the two methyls. And I'm all, I could always number this one, two, three, four. And four is connected to five, which is connected to six. Six has my aldehyde. 
Okay. All right, good. So do we ever have to worry about not being able to rotate? Here's a little summary of some examples you might want to watch out for. Let's do another problem where we rank these dyings in order of increasing reactivity, starting with the least reactive. All right, so I'm going to do some prep for this, A, B, C, and I will call these. These always make good multiple choice questions to uh, least, I said starting with the least reactive. So least reactive goes over here. And that means this is less reactive than this one, which is less reactive than that one. So we're going to find out which goes there and which one ends up with most reactive. All right, so uh, let's look at each of these. I'm going to highlight, use the highlighter tool to find my dying because these are bigger molecules. So my dying has to be a 1-3 relationship. So I've got a carbon 1-2 three, four, there we go. So it starts, oops, I keep forgetting to switch to my pen. One, I like to actually do my dying in red because it's electron rich and that usually is a color associated with that. So notice I have a one, three dying right there. So it's the, the alkene, in other words, first alkene starts at carbon one, the second alkene starts at carbon three, that's a one, three dying. Let's highlight the next one. This time I'll number first, just in case that makes more sense to you. One, two, three, four. Notice I'm not really concerned about all the other carbons. I'm looking for those four reactive carbons. And I have a, once again, a one, three relationship. So I do have a one, three diene. So I'm not, I'm not encountering the problem of them not being a one, three diene. All right, let's, while I'm on the highlighter tool, I'm gonna highlight my four carbons there and I'm gonna number them. Want, and it doesn't matter which order I number them in. Remember, this is arbitrary. I'm not trying to name it. I'm just trying to label it or track it. All right, so I got a 1,3 diene there. They're all conjugated. They are not necessarily all set up to be S cis, though. So notice the only one that's S cis is here. And it's in a ring. So that means it's actually locked in the S cis conformation. It's always S cis. That's good, right? Because we want uh, S cis in order, for, in order to do a Diels alder uh, however, we have the opposite problem in the first scenario. We have S trans in a ring system. It's not going to be able to rotate out of that, and it's locked there. We have S trans in an acyclic system, but it can rotate, and it can become S cis. So that will change the reactivity, the relative reactivity of each of those. That will dictate all of that. So the fact that this has to freely rotate to get to the ideal conformation for the reaction to occur means it's actually going to be less reactive than one that's always in the preferred conformation. However, because this one can never be in the preferred conformation, it's by far the least reactive, it's actually unreactive. So A is going to be the least reactive, or even unreactive, so we can put extra uh, less than there. Um, A is the least reactive, in fact unreactive. I would say C because it's not ready to go, and B is the most reactive because it's locked ready to go in that um, conformation. Okay, so that, in a nutshell, is Diels-Alder requirement number two. The dyne must be allowed to get in the S cis conformation in order to do Diels-Alder. Let's look at requirement number three. We're, that was more of a shape requirement. We're going to be looking at a stair, uh, an electronic requirement now. The dienophile works best with an electron withdrawing group, which I will abbreviate EWG. So what is an electron withdrawing group? Just as a refresher, we are going to explore carbonyls. They're very common, electron withdrawing groups. You'll see them over and over again, having that property. So we're gonna use resonance to show that. Why does an electron, with, just take a second to think, while well, I take a drink. Why does an electron withdrawing group make speed up a reaction if it's attached to a dienophile? Dienophiles are electron poor. 
right? They're supposed to be. They're supposed to love the electron-rich diene. So if we make the dienophile more electron poor by adding an electron withdrawing group, then we should conceivably make it more reactive. So if you want to speed up the reaction of a Diels Alder, we want to add an electron withdrawing group to the dienophile. So one of our favorite electron withdrawing groups will be a carbonyl, which is why my model that I started with today had a carbonyl, has an aldehyde on it. So I'm going to push the electrons to show how a carbonyl is electron withdrawing. So first let's always show our lone pairs. Let's push our arrow to show how we can add another lone pair. We can always draw that resonance structure with a carbonyl even though it's not ideal because we're starting off with a neutral contributor and we're going to make the Zwitter ion. There's really no way around it, but the Zwitter ion, which means the uh, doubly charged species that cancels out, charge separated resonance contributor, the Zwitter ion reveals where the charge density is. So it's useful to look at. Okay, so it reveals that we have a uh, electron rich concentration on the oxygen and electron poor concentration on the carbon. And we're not done because we ha can draw a resonance structure allowing that pi bond to delocalize. And so I'm drawing them all out. And notice that that positive charge can be delocalized between those two carbons. Why is that helpful for our dienophile? So remember, these, this could be carbon 5 and 6 in our ring, right? And if I keep writing that over, 5 and 6, 5 and 6. The wonderful thing about that is we are supposed to, these are the reactive carbons, and if we have a group attached that's sucking out electron density, then we make it more reactive. We make it a better dienophile. And look at what happens with our resonance structures. We can see when there's a carbonyl attached, it's a better dienophile because look at carbon five has a positive charge on it. And so that is evidence that electron withdrawing groups will make a dienophile an even bigger dienophile. Okay, so carbonyls aren't the only ones to watch out for. Other things that are electron withdrawing. So we've seen um, nitriles before. Uh, we've seen CF3, uh, nitro, and then I'm going to write carbonyl again just so we don't forget. So I'm just going to put Z here. So don't forget we have Z could be OH, carboxylic acid, it could be an amide, it could be an ester, it could be an aldehyde, it could be a ketone. So all of those carbonyl flavors that we, we know about. Okay, so let's use this information to do a problem. So knowing that we can have more reactive dienophiles and speed up our reaction with electron withdrawing groups attached, how would we rank these dienophiles as reactivities, or their reactivities in a diels alder reaction? So let's do the same thing we did before, turn it into kind of a multiple choice question where we have to fill in A, B, C, and we're gonna start with least reactive again here. And that's gonna mean that we're going this way. Okay, so let's look at our diene oh, file, excuse me. Here's our diene file. Look what's attached to it. Methyl. I'm gonna circle what's attached. Methyl or Carbonyl. Carbonyl. So these are carbonyl in the form of esters. So we have two electron withdrawing groups. We know esters are electron withdrawing. We have one electron withdrawing group, and in fact, methyls, you might recall, are actually weakly electron donating. So that will not make it more reactive. It will actually make it much less reactive because we're supposed to aim for electron poor dienophiles. So that means A is gonna be down here, and look at that, it's gonna go in order, A, B, C. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. That's our third requirement. We're gonna move on to four. Four is, you guessed it, the corollary. If the dienophile is supposed to be electron poor, 
in order to speed up the reaction, then the electron rich dying, could it be more electron rich to speed up a reaction? The answer is yes. So in other words, the dying works best with an electron donating group. Let's show an example of an electron donating group, a conjugated ether. So there's an ether with a lone pair conjugated. Look what it can do. Once again, resonance is the answer <laughs> to show us what it can do. Push that down and let the electrons land on that carbon. Here's our oxygen, it's now positively charged. Yes, we are drawing this Witter ion. Yes, that is the least significant contributor, but it's a useful contributor and it exists because it tells us how electron density is distributed and that's what we're interested in right now. So we have a lone pair that landed right there. And you should already say, bingo, I just made my dying so electron rich, it's negatively charged. That's enough said, but we're gonna keep drawing. Because, there we go again, with our proof in the pudding of resonance, once again, negatively charged carbon, right? Actually, this is the better one because the new bond actually forms on this carbon, not this one. So this is the most exciting one by far because our new bond when we make our ring actually forms from here to the electron poor dienophile. So it's very important that that one's attracted to it. So that is a um, significant finding when we look at our uh, resonance. So in other words, I'll write this summary here. Dying is more electron rich with OET and other electron donating groups, EDG attached. Some other countries call them ERGs, so if you look at a different source of electron releasing groups, um, you might see a little bit of that, um, but they're one and the same. Okay, so other ones you want to watch out for. Now we've seen these before, but it's really good to have a reminder. Um, of course, the one we just did, ether, um, but it's kind of similar cousin to alcohol. Amines of all var varieties, NHR, NH2, NHR. Um, these are stronger electron donating groups. A weaker electron donating groups would be R groups. Um, even sulfur, because that has a similar electronegativity as carbon. So I might write here strong, and these are weaker. But they're still electron donating, so they still increase the reaction compared to H, which does nothing. H is our baseline. So if we have, uh, the worst case scenario would be to have something electron withdrawing. That would slow down the reaction. So why don't, we, why don't we look at that in context and do an, an example problem? Once again, we're gonna do some ranking. This is a popular type of homework problem, so we're gonna do lots of those. Before we get into drawing lots of products, um, understanding the reactivity and reaction rates is really common. So let's do, we have four choices this time. Let's call them A, B, C, D. We're starting with the least reactive, again, not always going to be the case, but we're keeping it consistent for lecture. Um, and we have four choices. Now we're going to label what's attached to our dienes. And remember, we want to make our diene more reactive by adding electron donating groups to it. So we're going to look at what's attached to the diene and label what's attached. So let's get a OR. That's electron donating. And in fact, it's strong. In fact, that's the one we did our resonance structures for, right? That's a C right there, CN, nitrile. That's not on our electron donating list, and that's because it's not electron donating. It's on our electron withdrawing list. 
doesn't like that one. This one has only H's attached. So those don't count as electron donor and electron drawing. And R group, methyl, counts as a weak electron donating. So we have enough information now to go ahead and establish a ranking. I think we could all agree that the strong electron donating group will be the most reactive dying. So most reactive is way down here. Oh, notice I um, did a common mistake. I hope I didn't do that earlier. I, um, this is why I uh, highly recommend to avoid my error. Um, let me point what I did before I undo it. Least reactive should not have greater than signs going toward it, right? If it's more reactive, that's confusing, right? So the most reactive ends up here. So that's why I write the word and the symbol so I can catch myself if I do that. So I do that too. Um, so just when you're practicing that, um, it's really easy just to switch two things. So if I decided least reactive is on the right, then I'm gonna have less thans following it. And just to be extra clear, I should probably write most reactive right here, just to prevent anything. So most reactive is gonna have the greatest, um, greater than right there, there we go. Now that makes more sense. Okay, back to where we were. Most reactive, we decided was A. All right, next most reactive would be the weekly electron donating. That's the only electron donating we have. C would be right there um, after that because it's not very reactive, but it's not unreactive. Whereas B would actually be pretty unreactive because we're actually electrons drawing. So if you have an electron poor dying, it's not gonna really uh, wanna react with an electron poor dienophile. So those are the four requirements for diels alder reaction to actually happen. We're gonna shift gears and we're gonna assume that it happens now. Uh, or we're going to make sure it happens anyway. And um, with the examples I'm giving you, and with the examples I'm giving you, when we make sure it happens, we're going to learn how to properly draw the products when there's variable regio or stereo selectivity. So let's do those one at a time, because that's by far where we step up a level of the complexity. Okay, so simplest one to start with as a rule that the stereochemistry of the dienophile will help dictate the stereochemistry of the product. So what does that mean? So notice that I have, let me draw my, um, air, my numbers first. I'm gonna do a Diels-Alder two ways with a cis alkene and a trans alkene or a Z alkene and an E alkene. When I'm done, in my dienophile, I will hold the same. So when I'm only varying the alkenes, then, and my diene is staying the same, um, then I will have, I should expect different stereochemical outcomes for the cis versus the trans. So I know I have two acyclic pieces. I know I should have six-membered ring when I'm done. So let's start by drawing our six-membered rings. All right, and remember that the diene always has the four core carbons that are part of it, and they connect to the fifth and the sixth carbon for the dienophile. Okay? And so remember that between carbon two and three, I'm going, let's just actually number our, um, our new ring systems to help track that one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now in blue, five, six, five, six. All right, so in black, I'm going to add in the, the three groups that we're missing. The pi bond is always between that carbon two and three. That's easy so far. Carbon six and carbon five have carboxylic acids on them, CO2H. That's what that stands for, right? CO2H. So notice I have a cis, I'm going to do a highlighter here, a cis alkene here, and a trans alkene here. Uh, 
Uh, keep sit, keep highlighter on that. I'm gonna switch to the pen. So cis alkene dienophile. That is going to give us the cis relationship in the product. We retain that stereo chemistry. We have a trans alkene here, right? These are trans to each other. That is going to give us the trans relationship in the product. So there's no reason that would be any different. If it helps you, go ahead and draw on your H's that are missing there. So those H's will be on the same side in the product. These H's will be on opposite sides in the product. So now I need to draw what's on carbon six and five. So carbon five has a CO2H. Carbon six has a CO2H. They need to be on the same side. Does it matter whether I draw them as both dashes or both wedges? No, that's because they'll be the same, but I'm gonna draw them both anyway, just to prove that. Okay, so I'm gonna do both dashes, both down, because they're cis to each other. But I like to be thorough and consider everything before we make a decision, and I'm gonna draw both wedges. It's good to always do that just in case there is a difference, but in this scenario, because they're symmetric, I have a plane of symmetry right there, right? So all I have to do is do a pancake flip, and this is the same as this. So I did not draw anything new. So these are the same. So I only really have one unique product when I start with a cis alkene that's symmetric. How about if I start with a trans alkene that's symmetric? Well, I can't have both dashes and both wedges. If, I if one's a dash, the other has to be a wedge. So let's start with one a dash. That means the other one has to be a wedge. Let's draw the other scenario. Why couldn't the top one be a wedge? and the bottom one be a dash? Well, it can. And in fact, those are actually different. So we have to consider them. How do I know they're different? If I try to pick, there's no plane of symmetry. And if I pick one up and try to put it on top, I do not superimpose them. So in other words, this is a set of enantiomers and they are both possible to form. So I will abbreviate that as a plus minus. Those are a pair of enantiomers or also known as racemic mixture. So if I could form the one, I could equally likely form the other. And that's because they stack this way, but they have an equal probability of stacking this way, whether it approach from the bottom or the top. Top approach, bottom approach, 50-50 chance of either one. When there's symmetry, so much symmetry that it results in the same product either way, then we only have one unique product, and that's because this is the meso scenario. So this, it's, you have to be very cautious about just saying, oh, it's always racemic, because it has a 50-50 chance of going away. Most of the time it's racemic, uh, but if there's a plane of symmetry, that's not true, right? Because we tried to draw a racemic mixture here, and we failed to do so because of the symmetry. So, moral of the story, start with a symmetric Alkene, whether it's cis or trans, we retain it. Cis starting material, cis product. Trans starting material, trans product. Okay, and then always consider the top and the bottom approach by, uh, by allowing yourself to consider both enantiomers if they, if they exist. So proceed with caution with that. Okay, so that was rule number one for stereoselectivity. You retain the cis and trans relationship. Rule number two, endo approach is the major product. You might've heard that prefix endo in many things before, endocytosis, right? Endo means like the interior, it's taking, it's inward. So it's going in. So in other words, if there's any substituents on the dienophile, the one that faces in as opposed to out is the preferred approach. So let's take a look at that and see how that can affect the stereochemical outcome.
In other words, if I were to keep my dying, uh, where's my pen? There we go. Keep my dying in the same orientation, but notice I have this substituent here. This is going to be my electron withdrawing group that helps make my dienophile more reactive. If it's pointing outward, away from the dying, then I would call that the exo approach. And I purposely picked a dying that was cyclic to start with, say, uh-oh, here's another problem. We're going to solve two problems with one in this scenario. I have a cyclic starting material, but I'm supposed to already have a cyclic product. So if you start with a cyclic starting material, you're going to have a second cyclic for, uh, product forming. So sec second cycle, <laughs> which means you're going to have a bicyclic product. So how do we handle those? They're common, which is why I threw this one in here. And so let's try the EXO approach first, which is minor. So if you're asked to draw all products, that's where the wording is really important um, in your homework or any of your assigned uh, assignments or exams. If you're asked to, to identify all products, um, endos and EXO are included. But if it's major, we only look at endo approach, and we'll see why soon. So to understand which one's which, we'll have to look at both. So the exo approach means that the keep the diene still. So let's just say we have this, this diene and we have the red aldehyde, could be our electron drying group. It's gonna face away from it as it goes under, as opposed to toward it. So it faces away. We're gonna number our core six carbons that are part of this reaction. One, two, three. There's our one, three diene, four. I can label that fifth one, but I'm not going to because I wanted to find the four in the diene that react. I'm gonna go on to label five and six. Now, if you want to, just for a good measure, go ahead, go ahead and label this seven, just so we could track that carbon, but we don't have to number it if you uh, prefer not to, because it's not part of the reaction. We already identified the six carbons, the four, one through four in red, five and six in blue. Okay, so how does this work? I'm gonna do in green, attack carbon four, release those electrons between two and three to make that pi bond. The carbon one and two pi bond, attack six. So what's going on with seven? It looks like it's in the way. It actually just folds up. Remember those uh, cyclopentane rings can have like that little envelope conformation. So that point on carbon seven folds up like an envelope and it just moves out of the way. It's a little bridge that just pulls up and allows those bonds to form underneath. So we, we're gonna intentionally draw it kind of to the side instead of looking face straight on down so that it looks like this. So here's our six membered ring. It looks almost kind of boat shaped there. And we're gonna connect the bridge head right there. So that was carbon seven, that point that folded up. So my original five membered ring is right here. And my diene ophile, two carbons are here. So I'm gonna number that to keep track. That's why we do the numbering. Here's my carbon one, two, three, four. Here's my five and my six. So my new bonds are here, here, here. So that's where I made the new bonds. Seven is my bridged carbon. I had to fold up and get out of the way. Now, if I just draw the product as it is written without approach, then I'm gonna have to figure out how Z fits in there. So remember there's an H right there. And so H was pointing in and my two positions on this carbon five are like that. So H is closer to the interior, it's closer to carbon four, so that would be this position, and Z is closer to the exterior, so that would be that position. So that would be if we have the approach where I'm drawing it from the bottom, it folded up, but remember, it can equally come from the top and fold down. So my default, I suggest you kind of have the same for yourself. My default approach is keep the dying fixed, 
dienophile approaches from the bottom. And then I do the, I mentally uh, make the opposite for the enantiomer because I acknowledge the fact that it could have equally come from the top. It's much easier to draw the bridge folding up than to have it approach from the top and draw the bridge folding down, at least it is for me. So my default approach is I always have them start off next to each other like they are on the paper, move them out of the plane, so that's how I visualize it. And I have a movie for that and the um, models to help too. The dienophile moves to stack parallel under. And then if it's exo, that group is out. If it's endo, the group is in. And you snap those bonds together and you make your ring. Okay, so that's what that looks like. You might sometimes even see this drawn flat again. How did that look? It would have it kind of coming out of the plane as wedges, like that. And then my Z, since I'm looking at it, if I'm looking at it that way, my I is actually up here. So the Z would be on this carbon and it's above the H, so it would be a wedge. So those are two of the same ways to represent the same product. You wanna be familiar or comfortable drawing it both ways. This is actually the minor product. We're gonna to get to the major now and we'll, then we'll talk about why. So the endo approach means we just flip that around so that the Z is coming in underneath, right? Underneath there. So if we have our model kit, it's coming in this way as opposed to pointing out, that's exo, endo is coming in. Now, let's do this again. This will fold up, pot new pi bond there. Only difference is Z is pointing in, so it's the down position, and that H is up. So that gives me a different looking product. This is my major path. So make sure that makes sense. And um, a good question is think about why. Why is it favorable to have your electron withdrawing group, that's what Z is, underneath your dying. Your dying. Remember what we're doing with the orbitals. It goes back to that. I won't go, we could go in a lot more detail with orbitals, so I won't go into too much. But remember that when we have our dying, we are taking the homo of the dying, and we're taking the lumo of the dienophile. And if we have something electron rich, and we have something electron poor, and we, we always know that distributing electron density evenly is, leads to ultimate stabilization. If we have an electron withdrawing group, so I'm just gonna complete this to be, remind ourselves this equals electron withdrawing group. If we put an electron withdrawing group under something that's electron rich, doesn't that stabilize it? The answer is yes. If something's electron rich and you add something electron withdrawing to it, you're kind of like neutralizing it. You could think of it that way. And we could draw more orbitals to show that, but I'm gonna stop the, we call that a secondary orbital interaction. So I will write that out, but we don't. Ha you're not responsible for drawing out every um, step of that. It's just good to know that it's not a secret why endo is preferred. Endo means that when you get that electron withdrawing group situated under something electron rich, it helps stabilize the electron rich group by making it not quite so electron rich, sharing, sharing space. There's more orbitals on this electron withdrawing group. So that's the, hence the secondary orbital overlap. So in other words, when this, these stack, these orbitals overlap no matter what, the LUMO and the HOMO, but there's extra orbitals on the electron withdrawing group that can add some stabilization to the groups here and they can't overlap if they're facing outward, but they can overlap if they're facing inward. That added orbital overlap provides more stabilization. So the extra orbital overlap is referred to as secondary. The primary orbital overlap is required. Secondary is optional, but that's what 
leads it to be the major product. Okay, so that's why we like to, we see actually a bit bigger product distribution of endo. Okay, so how do we draw this? Let's do some examples where we actually draw real things instead of a Z. Okay, so two rings this time. That means our final product should actually have three rings because we're always adding a ring. Our dyne right here. Look at our dienophile as part of a ring. This is a very famous one. It's called maleic anhydride. We actually even use this one in the lab. Um, it's a great dienophile because it has two electron drying groups all wrapped up into it. Uh, and then we have cyclohexadiene. And notice the bridge has two carbons in it. So we have to fold it up, right? So we're going to draw our, our bridge. So our new six-membered ring looks like a boat because we are starting off with a ring. But our bridge actually has two carbons in it. So I'm going to number these to keep track. My main carbons are one, two, three, four. And the ones in the, that are forming the ring, I'm going to call this five and six. I will keep numbering so I can because I have more to keep track of. I'll call those seven and eight. So the new six-membered ring, I should be able to connect one through six without a problem. So it's one, two, three, four, and then four bonded to. Uh, I drew these. I four actually bonded to six as I drew it. That's okay. I might erase that and renumber them so it's not as confusing. I like four to bond to five just because the numbering makes more sense doesn't have to be but okay so five and six always make a new pi bond between two and three what happened to seven and eight seven eight is bonded to four seven is bonded to one they're in that bridge so this bridge that folded up out of the way is part of this original ring six and five are part of maleic anhydride don't forget we had H's on there. How are we going to draw those H's and the maleic anhydride and still obey the endo rule? Well, we need to rotate this so that it's endo. This whole chunk needs to be under this one. And we can kind of visualize the 3D a little bit better by noticing that this is how it's going to form right there, those dotted lines. So when you imagine this folding up out of the way, it's going to come up. Those dotted lines are the new bonds right here. And the H's are coming straight out like this, which means my ring is actually on the down position. A little bit of a challenge to draw, huh? So don't worry, we can do it because it's been done. There we go. Now you may see it drawn that way. That's kind of the side view with the little the boat orientation, but you may also see it drawn uh, where your eyes are looking at it flat on from this perspective, right? So let's also draw it that way. So we could have a two car, here's our alkene. We could have a two carbon bridge. So have that little zigzag in there. And then we could draw our ring on a dash to show that the H's are coming above it. And that's just from the bottom approach. We'd have the exact opposite for the top approach. Do we need to draw the exact opposite? Do we see a plane of symmetry? Right down the middle, right? So it's actually meso. So we don't need to draw both approaches because if we draw the opposite, in other words, dash the bridge, wedge the ring, uh, we will end up with a flip, simple flip to arrive at the same product. Let's try one where it will matter. Uh, that's Well, well that'll, that'll pose a challenge. I know these bridge things look a little funky, but to be honest, they're easier because you have they're tied together and you're kind of forced into pulling them up 
and then it helps you get the stereochemistry right here. It's, believe it or not, harder without the bridge. So let's go back to a situation where we have fixed stereochemistry without a bridge, um, and it's still symmetric, so that keeps it simple. So this doesn't matter whether this aligns up or, you know, aldehyde on the bottom or the top, but it does need to be endo. So, so far it's the right approach. So here's endo, this is endo, so so far so good. Um, but if we do this example down here, we are going to want to draw in our H's where they matter. And why do they matter there? This is carbon one, two, sorry, I'm getting, having a hard time with my pen, two, three, four. So that's my dyne. My dienophile H's are right here, H, H, let's draw them all in. And this would be carbon five and six. Okay, so let's try to put this together and form our six-membered ring. And remember it's endo. I want you to try to take a minute to do that. I'm going to take a drink. I'm also going to put on my fan because this is a hot room. There we go. Six membered ring. So if you haven't done that yet, you might want to pause the video because I'm about to do it. This gets harder, so it's good to try. So we've already fixed the fact that we have an endo approach. We have our six carbons. What I like to do is draw the six membered ring right away. By the way, you're gonna also probably often see a delta over there. That just means heat is needed to make this reaction favorable. Let's draw our six membered ring. Let's label the one through six. We know the key components will be that pi bond between two and three, but the rest are gonna be a challenge. That's because we have to worry about getting the dashes and wedges just right. So remember we're going to visualize I'm going to visualize the dying staying at the top, the dienophile going endo from the bottom. Lock those bonds, the six membered ring into place. Then imagine kind of orienting it back to approach more of a planar st structure. So when I do that, you might need to build your, some models to visualize that. Uh, but the bridge made it easier, and we have no bridge here. So in order to make sure I don't mess up, a common strategy is to tie whatever groups were in the middle there, they happen to be H's in this case, and make a fake bridge. and we'll remove it later. So that's gonna be my fake bridged group. Okay, so let's draw it just like we did before with a bridge. And I'm just gonna circle it in red to remind myself I have to take care of that later because that's not, that's not really a CH2 there. Those are two different H's. What else was on there? So those two H's we imagined as part of the bridge, that what, they didn't have to be the H's, the methoxies could have been in there. But what pointed inside, based on the original starting stereochemistry of the diene, these two groups were the H's. They're gonna be my fake bridge. I circled what was ever, whatever was in the middle. So whatever's on the outside goes here. So I'm gonna write O-M-E. Okay, I have my new pi bond there. Let's number it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so because I came from below, I'm going to have this position here and here. My H is there, my CHO is there. Now I'm gonna remove the bridges. Because I don't have a bridged final product. It's just a, kind of a trick, if you will, to help me keep the stereochemistry straight. 
So if I get rid of this bridge here, just kind of block it, I realize those used to be an H on each one of those. Notice there, here's where the, the kind of trick comes in. Notice that the H is above the methoxies. So the H's would be wedges. Do we draw on the H's? Not always, we don't need to, but we need to draw on the methoxies. So if the H's are wedges, the methoxies are dashes. Okay, and then note that the H is above the aldehyde on carbon five. So the aldehyde is also a dash. Now I only did one approach. I could likewise have approached from the top. So I need to consider the, if there's an enantiomer, I see no plane of symmetry. So yes, I need to draw the opposite for the enantiomer. So the exact opposite would be every single stereocenter completely inverted that was part uh, that was formed as, as a result of this reaction. So those three dashes were formed as a result of this reaction. They need to be three wedges for the enantiomer. So this is a racemic mixture. Okay, so in summary, when the diene's acyclic, you can kind of have this spatial arrangement tracking system by treating the inside groups as a bridged group. And then remove that bridge later. It's like a little, uh, you know, sort of like a little template to keep it together and then you take it off at the end, just so you know how to track it. Okay, so that's how we track cyclic versus acyclic products. Another common starting material you might see is this one here. Look at this, this is an alkyne. So dienophiles can also be alkynes. So no one said that they can only have one pi bond. Only one pi bond reacts. These are actually the easiest, believe it or not. You don't have to worry about very much stereochemistry. Why? Because right now it's linear. When you remove a pi bond, we go to trigonal planar. And you're gonna say, yippee, I don't need to worry about dashes and wedges with trigonal planar. So that's actually a good thing. Um, one thing to keep in mind here is look at how we can also have H's external, like I did this on purpose. Our previous example had H's in the middle. We could also have had different groups in the middle. It just depends on how they were substituted on here. So the H's were out here. Uh, so let's, let's draw this product. So if we have an alkyne, I'm gonna actually number these. I think you're gonna like this one. Alkynes are always, uh, they look funny out of nowhere and they're, oh no, they're so hard, but they're actually simplest. So here's our carbon one, two, three. There's our one, three diene, four. It's gonna connect to five and six. There's the five and six uh, of the alkene for our dienophile, the pi bond for our dienophile. Let's draw our six membered ring. One, two, three, four, five, six. Always a new pi bond between two and three. Five and six lost a pi bond. Usually it results in a single sigma bond, but because we start with an alkyne, it had two pi bonds. If we lose one pi bond, we have one pi bond left over. So we start with a, let me just draw that a little more even. So we end with a diene, but it's not conjugated. It's a different diene than what we started with. Okay, now how do we draw what's attached? There's no worry about endo approach, it's linear. So it can't point in or out. So that makes it easy. Uh, on carbon, let's do the hard part first, on carbon one and four. So we could treat this this way. If we were gonna fold these up out of the way, inside groups, fold them up out of the way, that would mean the H's are outside and the OETs were folded up. So they would be above the plane. If they're above the plane, they're on wedges. So let's draw them on wedges. Carbon one has a wedged OET. Carbon four has a wedged OET. Now this is the part you're gonna like. I, I mean, I like it. Super simple. Do we put a dash or a wedge for CO2H? Carbon five and six both have a CO2H. Neither, it's trigonal planar. 
no dash or wedge because we're on an alkene at the end. So yippee, hooray for a little break for your brain. So when you see an alkyne, you can smile, right? Because I gave you this break on purpose because it's about to get to the hairiest example ever. And that's the regiochemistry. You might have thought stereochemistry was hard. Believe it or not, regiochemistry coupled with the stereochemistry is going to be kind of the big daddy reaction of all. Um, so let's, we haven't done it, at, we have not covered it all. We've just done stereochemistry. So now that we're going to do regiochemistry, why was it irrelevant so far? Because coincidentally, or not coincidentally actually, all of the examples I gave you so far were symmetric. And that's because we were trying to target what it looked like to alter the stereochemical outcome. Now we're going to target what it looks like. Now that we know the stereochemical preference, we know we prefer endo. We know what it looks like when it approaches from below or above. We know we can get the equal probability of both, so it can possibly lead to a racemic mixture. But we got to watch out for the meso. We got that straight, hopefully. Uh, but now we have to worry about regiochemistry when it's not symmetric. Okay, so that's the key. If the starting reagents are asymmetrically substituted, that's when you gotta buckle down, take a seat, and say, it's gonna take me a while to solve this. But it can, it's definitely doable. And who is going to tell us where these things go? Your friend resonance. We are going to fill this in last, but this is good. This is basically what we want to find out. We want to know the answer to this. We want to say, okay, here's our possibilities. It's, this is as complicated as it's going to get, regiochemically speaking. Okay, so come on, pointer. There we go. Uh, we can have a diene, and previously I've been giving you symmetric dienes, but we can have just one group here. How do we know where it's going to go? Is it going to line up? with the group, or we're we gonna flip it and line it up with it down here. So in other words, is this electron withdrawing group, when it flips over to go endo, is it gonna to prefer to be close to the electron donating group, or is it gonna flip another 180 to be away from the electron withdrawing group, or donating group, excuse me. Um, likewise here, how do we know which way these align? So if this is carbon one, two, three, four, how do we know if this is five and six, or this is five and six? How do we know it has to line up this way? Why can't it flip over? So we know just because it's drawn one way does not mean that's the proper alignment. So our goal is to figure out the proper alignment as we work through it. So to do that, we're gonna do some examples. All right, here we go. Starting some of the big problems. We have an asymmetric Dying an asymmetric dienophile. What does that mean? That means they're not, there's no plane of symmetry in the diene or the dienophile. Let's number our carbons. One, two, three, four. We don't know which one's going to be five or six, in other words. For, in other words, we don't know if we can call this five, six or five, six because look at what's going on here we have an electron donating group on carbon two. So what we don't know is would that aldehyde, the electron withdrawing group, rather be close to electron withdrawing group or far from it? So in other words, we it's hard to know how we're going to label yeah, one, two, three, four. I don't know which one's gonna be five and six. So I think I'm gonna call it A and B, just to clear this up. So since I don't know whether I'm gonna do five and six, come on, why aren't you erasing for me? It's having a slow reaction there, okay. Let's call it A and B, since that doesn't really depend on numerical order. So are we gonna have, in other words, are we gonna have this, or are we gonna have this? 
that. Is one gonna connect to B or A? We have an endo ready to go. So we've answered the, we've, we've already addressed that. It's lined up endo. But is it going to approach, let's keep, just to keep it simple, let's keep the methoxy fixed, but let's, let's have it approach endo. This is also endo. And so I kept this the same. Which one is preferred? How can we find out? And the answer is going to come where you're going to need to draw a resonance. What, we're going to do what we've been doing. We were showing why an electron withdrawing group is actually electron withdrawing and why an electron donating group is actually electron donating. We're going to do that again. So it's nothing you haven't actually done before, but we're going to use it. So let's do some resonance. So first I'm going to draw some resonance of the dying. So here's my dying. I'll just do it separately so I can circle the right one later. All right, so it can do literally push the electron density down that way and <clears throat> push those out to carbon one. All right, voila. That's all I can do there. Now we're gonna do resonance for the dienophile. We have to do resonance for both. I'm gonna redraw my dienophile. And I'm gonna show how it's electron withdrawing. So push the electrons away into that oxygen. And put my brackets there to indicate that I have a collection of resonance structures there. And away we go. A positive charge there. Zwitter ion, here we come. The answer is in the Zwitter ion. Okay, look at our Zwitter ions. That's a cute name. Let's write out Zwitter ion because it's actually an important part of the clue. So I'll even put eyeballs. We really want to look at the Zwitter ion. What can the Zwitter ion tell us? The truth is in the Zwitter ion. All right. Well, once again, I will number these carbons. One, two, three, four. And we have B and A. Would one be more attracted to B or A? Now that we look at the Zwitter ion. One's like in the looks of A, right? Not so into B. It sees A. Right? Because I see you. Okay. <laughs> so this confirmation has to flip in order to have the proper alignment that's preferred. Stays endo, but we're going to flip. So in other words, of these two endo approaches, remember we had an or, big fat or right here. One likes A. One is close to A. And this one. So that is the preferred orientation, not next to B. What that means is if we didn't do that properly, if we drew the answer to B, we would have our pi bond between two and three, we'd have our methoxy group on two, Those, that part stays the same, but on, I'm going to draw in our H's so that we know how to draw it in on our B carbon. We would have endo approach from below, meaning a dash, CHO here versus here. But this is not, we don't see the one, three product. See that relationship is one, three, one, two, three. We don't see that. We do see the one, four product, one, two, three, four. So, lots to consider. Watch your stereochemistry. Find your Zwitter ion to arrive at the correct regiochemistry. 
I'm gonna do one more because there's only one other way, and that's how we're gonna fill in the box to have this permutation. If I don't put a group on carbon two or three of the diene, but I put it on one or four, we also have to, we can get a slightly different looking outcome there. One, two, three, four. And we have to say, who's, who does one and four want to be next to, A or B? Nicely, it's already endo. So we have to say, do we want that? O-M-E. Or this be an A. To answer that, we've got to do the resonance. You ready to do it again? Let's do it. So it's a little different in this substitution pattern, which is why it's worth practicing both with me. Down, land on carbon two, lone pair on two. But you know what? I'm not really interested in that because two doesn't make the new bond. So I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna draw, a fan, you know, we're advanced now. We can draw more structures. Instead of letting it land on carbon two, let's push it to the bond between two and three to be a pi bond there and let the, the electrons land on carbon four. Bingo, there's a bond that's gonna be made to four. Carbon four makes a new bond. I care about what's charges on carbon four. Uh, in my Zwitter ion, right? So plus on there. Uh, let's see, sorry, this is getting kind of small there. So I'm skipping the one that's not relevant. I mean, I'm just kind of pushing through it. It didn't really, it's, it's still depicted through this arrow pushing, but uh, you know, in order, in, in order to avoid lots of extra structure writing, I'm going to the punchline here. So lone pair with the negative charge. One, two, three, four. Okay, we're gonna do the same, find the Zwitter ion for our dienophile. Electron withdrawing group pushes electrons up. Should look like this. When we're done, takes electrons away so that carbon A is the electron deficient one. All right, so here's my electron deficient carbon, here's my electron rich carbon. Looks like four would like to be next to A. Four is not next to A in this orientation. See, they're far apart. This is the preferred alignment. So that means that if we had written it as drawn, we would have, in other words, we're asking this, One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Are we gonna have A, B or B, A, right? So if we had written it as drawn, as the problem presented itself to you, it would have been wrong. You have got to flip it when you see that this Witter ion reveals who likes each other. So four and A wanna be close. Four and A are not close there. So this one's wrong. So I'm not even gonna bother drawing that possible product. I'm only gonna draw this one. What do I need to fill in? Carbon two and three are always has that pi bond. I need a group on one. Okay, so carbon one had an H going in. A little fake bridge that would go up. So that would be the up group. So that means the O and me is the down group. Okay, endo, approach of the aldehyde, right here, endo, means it's down when it's approached from the bottom, and that's on carbon B. Did I say B, and I drew it on A? I did, 
Gotta be that. That's why the labeling is a lifesaver. Yikes. Good. I hope you don't hate me for going back. B. So I would describe this substitution pattern as a one two relationship. Because if you start your numbering from scratch, once you get your product, the one position and the two position have groups next to each other. Okay? So now we're gonna use the consequence of this to summarize the first page. So plus an antimer, of course. So plus an antimer. How can I draw the antimer? The exact opposite, right? Okay, so I'm gonna use the results here to summarize the first page, because this is very overwhelming and this is hard. You've gotta solve it to get through it, but it helps to have sort of a generic look at what's going on here. So what did we learn? We learned that if we have an asymmetrically substituted diene and dienophile, as long as we do the endo approach, one, two, three, four. I'm going to call this A and B. Let's call this one, two, three, four. We'll call this A and B. Remember to do endo approach. We gotta know how to connect B and A. That's when I changed my five and six to A and B so that I can track it more easily. So we're always gonna get a six-membered ring in both cases. Here, let's fill in what we got. One, two, three, four for a template. One, two, three, four. We're gonna decide A and B last. Okay, always a pi bond between carbon two and three. Now, electron donating groups on carbon two in the top one, easy. Thank you very much. No dash or wedge to worry about there. On carbon A or B, how do I know what to do? Well, we worked through it. So I'm just writing the results here, but you want to kind of work through that again. A like to be next to four in this case when, that, when A was the one with the electron withdrawing group. So we had both possibilities here. This was a stereo center, so we had our racemic mixture there. And in the other scenario, just to summarize what we did, if we called those A and B, then we had sin relationships but we had the enantiomer possible as well. And this was the one four. Okay, so that is where I am stopping. I have a final exercise for you to do, to put it all together using the video and that accompanies this lecture, the 3D video, as well as this actual lecture, as well as your homework in the book. So I hope you enjoy Deals Alder. Complex, take your time getting through it. Good luck.